The healthcare industry is one of the most critical and fastest growing industry in the world. Now, with the provision of emergency services, the health workers are constantly saving lives. But is there enough remuneration for them? It's the big question. Now, the World Health Organization says that the standard doctor to patient ratio is 1 to 600. But in Nigeria, it is about one doctor to about 4,000 patients. While the House of Representatives have proposed a bill mandating Nigeria trained medical and dental practitioners to practice for five years before being granted full license to reduce medical tourism, the doctors have said it is a gross violation of their human rights. While there have been discussions about uh, reversing medical tourism, there is still little being done in that regard as the issue of poor remuneration, little or uh, or on-the-job trainings uh, still exists. So joining us uh, via Zoom to discuss this issue is the Chief Medical Director, University of Benin Teaching Hospital, Professor Darlington Obaseki. Uh, Professor, good morning. It's good to have you join us now on TVC Breakfast. Good morning. I'm happy to be here with you. Great. Now, recall that Nigeria used to be a country where people from around the world travel to, to Nigeria for medical attention. Uh, some of us may not have been born at the time, but after independence, before and after independence, in the 60s and even part of the 70s, uh, we hear that people came to Nigeria for medical, critical medical attention. And it was the glory days for Nigeria. But right now, we see how people are leaving in droves. Talk to us, basically, you have been in the system. Where did we go wrong? How did the tables change or turn so badly for Nigeria? Thank you for that question. You are very correct. Um, the country's uh, healthcare system has uh, not done as well as it ought to, but it will also be unfair to isolate the healthcare industry from the general economic, uh, general um, state of the country generally. It is not limited to the healthcare space alone. The Nigeria went wrong, not just in healthcare, I think most likely due to the military intervention in the 70s and the 80s, especially in the 90s, uh, when everything really went back across all industries, education, healthcare, manufacturing, so it's not unique to the healthcare. What happened to Nigeria? What happened to us? Not unique to us. But it's unique to the whole country. Right. Yeah. But uh, what's the situation like now? Seeing when we look at these glory days and uh, across many or all hospitals in Nigeria, it's safe to say that we're having a massive brain drain in in this critical health sector. Yeah. In Uniben Teaching Hospital, you know, give us a sense of how this is playing out over there. It's, the situation is very dire. Um, a lot of our colleagues are living, like you said, in droves. I am the chief executive of the teaching hospital, and every other day, one or doctor or one nurse is resigning or going on leave of absence, go outside the country. It's very bad. But let's put things in context also. We've had several iterations of this um, migration outside the country. This is about, I'm about 32 years a doctor now. This is about the third four or fourth one that I have experienced. There was a very large migration that also happened at this sometime between 89 and 1992, early 90s. But this is unique. This has been the severest, this is very bad. It's, and it's also unique because unlike previous iterations of migration of healthcare workers out of the country, where it was mostly, especially amongst the doctors, the specialist senior doctors that were leaving, this iteration now is everybody, the fresh doctor is leaving. Uh, we want to recruit doctors. Many of our departments are short across the country, almost all hospitals. You ask for it, you want to recruit doctors, there are no doctors to recruit. My internal medicine department, they are aborting right now. So you can't even begin to uh, overemphasize how serious this is. It's very serious, yeah. All right. Now, now as, as it is right now, uh, you, you are giving us a picture of the challenges that uh, we face in that regard. 
if we have to start taking steps towards reversing this right now, I wonder where we need to start from because it looks like or it feels like a very huge problem on our hands right on our hands right now. Where do we start from if we have to start reversing this? I think to address that, answer that question, we need to uh, look at what is primarily responsible for this. I, I think there are three major reasons. The first thing is economic. The general economic situation in the country is not good. With every round of agitations by healthcare workers, by doctors for improving welfare, improvement in their welfare package, before they even settle down to enjoy the benefit, another inflationary trend wipes out everything they've gained. So at least on that round of agitation. So it's a vicious circle in that regard. So economic factor is one. Two, inability, according to some of them, for them to actually uh, actualize their full potentials as top-notch professionals. I mean, somebody is a cardiovascular surgeon, for example, he just doesn't want to be prescribing drugs. He wants to do more, he wants to do more. So they leave because of that. Then thirdly, they, 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 a lot of my our colleagues, fellow uh, healthcare workers, they have apprehension about the general state of the country. So many of them just want to um, hedge their bets, uh, create what they call this, this an alternative scenario where they can have um, an outlet if case things really go very bad. And of course, you know this is not even limited to the healthcare space alone. Even tech engineers, bankers, they are all living in that regard. So to address this, one, for me, I would say the economy just have to, we, that's key to it all. We need to do better economically because if we can't pay our professionals um, uh, their due wages that they feel is relevant to them, that can keep them going, there's nothing you're going to do to, to make them stay. I think that's for me is key. Right. And um, of course, if I'm correct, you're in your sixth year uh, steering the ship at, at the teaching hospital in, in Uniben. With these challenges and, you know, at this time of, um, you know, national, you know, general issues now you know, pervading the health sector specifically, how does it fit in? How does it all fit in? or reflect on your strategic plan uh, to obviously take the hospital to greater heights? It's, it's a major, major, major uh, challenge for us because we, like you rightly said, we do have a strategic plan, which is to, and the vision, which is to make the best job in the teaching hospital, the medical hub of excellence in the West Africa sub-region, which is what it was envisaged to be by the founding fathers. You can't do this without specialists, without is, is, if, for example, we are training people to start renal transplantation, you, the, the training and the program itself is centered around a nephrologist, a urologist, a surgeon. If by the time you finish training, they, by the time you do one or two, they leave. And most times, individual driven, maybe one or two persons are the focal points, are the drivers of this intervention. If by the time you have started and they are leaving, it's going to be it's like uh, trying to get water out of a rock. It's really, really challenging to really try to excel when every time it's like a wound that you keep excavating as you try to mend it, it heals it, somebody comes and scratches it again. It's not, I can't even begin to overemphasize how terrible and how difficult it is, not just for me, for all my colleagues, all chief medical directors across the country. All right. We know that uh, the University of Benin Teaching Hospital is a federal uh, institution, but considering the vital essential service that you provide in where you are, you find where you're located, what kind of support are you getting from, say, the state government or the local governments or even private institutions uh, that operate within that area? Can you share with us? Yeah, that's a good question. And for those of us that have had the opportunity to travel out and see how other healthcare systems are run, you will notice that public healthcare facilities, they just don't depend alone on government subvention. The, there's a lot of charity work, charity and philanthropy going to public hospitals outside this country. When we came on board 2017, that was the first thing we took note of that. We, have, we, we are not having any form of support outside 
when the normal government subvention. So for the past six years, we've been very aggressive on that. And I can say we are very pleased to say yes, a couple of them, private sector individuals, have come and have thrown their weight behind the hospital. I also think we as healthcare workers, healthcare executives, should also take part of the blame. I don't think we do enough of advocacy. I don't think we do enough of uh, telling the people why they need to do this. A lot, there are a lot of uh, persons who are willing to come in, a lot of organizations willing to come in. As for the, like I said, the federal government is doing its best. I, I, I must also say, especially since COVID, a lot of intervention went into the federal government, federal tertiary institution, a lot. I, I think this probably has been, been the best uh, period in tertiary care delivery system in the country because everybody realized they needed to, they needed to strengthen our tertiary care institutions. I think the federal government stepped up in that regard. The state government, specifically uh, those state government now, the, go the governor has been very passionate about us working together. He keeps, he keeps saying it that, look, he doesn't believe there, is, there should be dichotomy. We should work in silos between the local, the state, and the federal government institutions. And we should all work together to, since we are serving the same people, all at those state institutions. So they've been providing a lot of support for us, especially during COVID, where they helped us to provide care for the citizens of the state. Yeah. Right, Prof, you spoke earlier, though briefly, uh, about, you know, the replacement um, hurdle that, that we are in now. So we have doctors and other medical personnel living in droves, but, but then what's the plan on ground to ensure that their, their critical positions are replaced as quickly as possible? Uh, some have said perhaps those that have retired should um, come back, their services are needed, or those who are there can find a way to consult, even though they're, they're abroad. Uh, tell us, give us your thoughts on, on this, uh, this issue, on how best to tackle the issue of replacing uh, the needed hands. Yes, the Honorable Minister of Health, even just yesterday, recently now, also touched on this. We, although we have not seen it in practical demonstration yet, there's a policy that the Ministry of Health has put in place that it should be one for one replacement. But for him, if a, head work, if a doctor leaves or a nurse leaves, that hospital, the hospital where or she lives, the left should be able to seamlessly recruit somebody to take his place without necessarily going through the regulatory approvals. We have not seen that full play yet because we for us to recruit doctors, nurses now, for example, we are very short. You will still need to go through four, five different regulatory agencies for the Federal Character Commission, Head of Service, Budget Office, Federal Minister of Health. We still need to do that before they can be allowed to come in to enter the integrated uh, payment platform called IPs. So it's not as seamless as this. I think it's a work in progress. We are hopeful that soon that will be done. Then you mentioned the issue of, um, of um, the retired staff. Yes, it's, it's a bit tricky on that. We we, we do have that, but productivity um, is also key. It's not um, doctors, especially in teaching hospitals, professors retire 70 years now. So 70 year old person is not easy for them to do the work to a younger person, especially in critical situations. Yes, we, we are trying to do that. Like for example, with anesthesia department in UBTH, we have somebody, who, professor who retired, she's been the one helping us hold the ship over there for a while now. But there's that much we can ask of her, that much we can ask of those, those persons who have worked very hard and deserve to rest a little. Yes, I think we need to advocate more that that one for one policy should happen because there are people, as we still speak, there are still doctors, still nurses looking for jobs. It's not as if we are totally uh, bereft of healthcare workers who don't want to get into the system. But we just can't bring them in as we as chief executive of tertiary hospitals would love to as quickly as possible. All right. Uh, recently, uh, the House of Representatives was considering a bill to compel medical doctors in Nigeria to practice for at least five years before they can either leave or go into other ventures as the case may be that didn't sit down well with uh, a lot of medical in fact in <laughs> i think in the entire uh, medical profession that didn't sit uh, well with them i i wonder what your 
uh, opinion or perspective is to this uh, consideration? Because he has been a national debate as far as Nigerians are concerned. Because the House of Representatives, from where they were coming from, they say it's their own way of trying to salvage the situation and preventing medical doctors from leaving the country so they can be available for essential services in the country. Yes, um, it, it is in our way with us because um, a lot of my colleagues feel that we are unfairly targeting healthcare workers for that if you are punishing them as it were for the situation in the country. Uh, we didn't think that is fair. Um, the philosophy behind that bill, I think, is simply that, uh, according to the proponent of the bill, is that federal government or the government trains these persons, these doctors and nurses, and we will expect them at subsidized rates, we will expect them to stay for a while before they can leave. But then again, it's, it's, we, we all pay the same fees for tertiary education in the country. So why pick on doctors only, even if we are... So we are definitely infringing on our rights to be able to do that. That's what my colleagues feel, and I think I, I go along with that. If that will not solve the problem, otherwise people will just... And secondly, there's also the problem of a lot of persons, the federal government does not have an input to their training, a lot of private healthcare, private um, uh, universities, training doctors now. You can't force them. You shouldn't be forcing them to stay when you think uh, they paid very well for their education. So there's a lot of fine tuning needs to be done. A lot before such bills are taken to National Assembly, in my opinion, there should be an intensive stakeholders engagement. Nigeria Medical Association, the MDCN, Medical Data Council of Nigeria, the Nigeria National Association of Nigeria Nurses and Midwives, Pharmacist Council of Nigeria, they should be brought to the round table and those things it should be a, a consensus before you just push out the bill. You don't, there's something called stakeholders engagement in policy formulation. You don't just come and choose things that are inspectable to just accept it. Right. And uh, another side of the argument, of that argument, is that uh, earlier on, not this uh, you know, present assembly of federal lawmakers, uh, there was a bill to ensure that everyone, especially political uh, office holders, must get treated, must seek medical treatment within the country and not travel abroad uh, for, for treatment. And uh, that idea before the lawmakers, when it was mooted, was also, you know, th thrown out. And uh, that also cropped up again, especially in, in line with this uh, bill that we understand is before the House of Representatives. Uh, w when you look at both scenarios, uh, Prof, how, what lessons do you draw out? From them, yes. Thank you for that for that angle. I'm writing a book now called uh, "Skin in the Game," where people who have no stake, as it were, in a particular situation, are taking decisions for the rest of us. When um, so, we should we should we take treating things in isolation will not solve the real problem. There's a big problem here where we are being led people who have no skin in the game. Skin in the game in the sense that I, I, would even, I, would even, I would even want to go to healthcare, seeking healthcare abroad. I would even want to go into education of our children. Elected and appointed officials, senior officials of government, if they are all, they all from primary school, secondary school, tertiary education, if they are all, they all have their children schooling abroad, what stake do they have in what happens here? So this it, people, for people from Malay, we, they need to come clean. They said he will come to him, he must come clean hand. Mm. They need to come clean hand. They, are, they don't have a dog in the fight, most of these persons. They don't have a dog in the fight. They, they, they have already come. They don't have uh, every little turbulence. They are jetting out and leaving us to handle the situation. So and they, and they come back and want to make policies that affect all of us when they don't have a stick. Their children are not here. So for me, it's not fair for people to be at that level, formulating policies that affect all of us without having a stick, a personal stick in how those policies play out. All right, uh, Professor, the...
you, you you mentioned earlier that the issue, the challenges in the in in the country that you, you were elaborating why we even have the issue of the brain drain in the first place and you the economic challenges was part of what you gave us one of the biggest reasons now but where we are right now the challenge of nigeria is multi dimensional we we've seen poverty uh, rates rise to the ceiling we've seen unemployment rates rise we've seen inflation rates rise we've seen hunger everything is rising all the indices that uh, choke the human standard of living is rising corruption uh, perception index is rising everything is rising all against the nigerian people do you see the hope in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in view of this, do you see the possibility of reversing this brain drain that has been an issue of debate for decades now and is getting worse? Do you see it being reversed anytime soon? Do you have the hope somewhere, how, somehow? Yeah, yeah, there's hope. There's always hope. Hope is what keeps us alive. Hope is what keeps us going. There's hope. Um, as we speak, as bad as things are, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't believe it. There are still so many of us, so many persons here trying their level best. So many institutions to give the best or the very difficult position they are in. I, I, there's some, somebody wrote something some time ago, some 10 years ago about Nigeria, that they were a country where we are not dichotomizing to either you are a villain or you are a victim, that we don't have heroes anymore. I disagree with that. Yes, there are a few now. In the healthcare space, I will use my hospital as an example. We, 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 we are practically squeezing water out of a rock. I was in, we were in my emergency room department two days ago. My colleagues came from other hospitals. And it's, it's crazy. The, the, the stream of persons that are coming, you see the doctors there. You, people need to come, like I said, have a skin in the game, come and see what's going on. There are heroes still available in Nigeria. There are people working. There are doctors in my hospital that worked in nine, from the consult from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. They can't close because the hospital is overwhelmed with work. People are streaming in from all over the south south region to come and attend to them. And look, you don't hear about these persons. So they're so because people are still around who are giving their best in a very difficult situation. They are not being celebrated, especially the COVID came. Um, our healthcare workers did fantastically well. The celebration of our healthcare workers. That was taken for granted. I remember sometime, I think during the height of COVID in London, for example, at a particular time, was it 12 midnight or 12 midday? I can't remember. The whole time stopped just to give an applause for one minute to all their healthcare workers. Our healthcare workers do feel sometimes unappreciated and underappreciated. So there's hope when you come down to the grassroots, when you come down to the front line, the average healthcare worker, the average nurse, the average doctor, the average paramedic, the average pharmacist, you come and see what they are doing. As we are speaking, 7.30, they are their duty post. They don't close the when they close. Unlike so many other sectors in Nigeria where you, you go to the offices, 9, 10, they are not there. That doesn't happen in the air care space. So there is hope. If we can come down to the front line and see the real people that are really working and promote them and give them, give them some motivation to say, look, even if we, we don't have money, we know we are not paying you enough. We can keep um, just to say thank you for what you are doing. That's all the, some of the times we ask for. Right, and I, I was just about to ask, especially as um, a new uh, administration is uh, set to be inaugurated in a matter of days, what kind of um, incentives, uh, review of um, you know, living standards for medical personnel would you be advocating for at this time? We, the incoming administration of CYG uh, Bola and Tinubu, we are very optimistic uh, because, say what you may of him, is known to be competence driven. So, I, I personally am very keen to see the team he has able to, 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 to drive his head agenda. I do know that we all know this as one of his big assets that he picks the best. So, I'm very sure I, we will be patient and watch. And we are here, we know some of the people around him, the healthcare space, uh, to also provide that support. We, we are very confident that things will look up after inauguration. 
All right, Professor, the, uh, we know that in the, in the medical world, we have the primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, uh, levels in, in medical care. And the, the service that you render is, is at the level of the tertiary uh, level. However, I wonder how the people's ignorance or illiteracy on one hand, where issues that should have been taken to a primary health care will be brought to uh, your institution for attention. I, I wonder how this puts pressure on you or, or how you handle all of these, because within Benin, we understand there are general hospitals, there are private hospitals, there are specialist hospitals, there are even primary health care uh, and so on. But share with us that, uh, how you handle that situation. So personally, I, I think um, the, the emphasis on primary health care in Nigeria is, 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 is not being contextualized appropriately. Primary health care is supposed to be the first point of call for somebody who's not feeling too well as a consulting clinic, basically. And, and stabilization points. But until we correct a very big anomaly in healthcare delivery in Nigeria, where anybody can walk across the, the streets and enter a shop and buy some of the most uh, potent medicines, primary care won't work, especially in the upper centers. Nobody, no Nigerian will go to a primary care center, manned by a non-doctor, especially, because before he does that, he would have taken treatment, got, taken, bought all sorts of things. And so by the time he's, they are coming to seek help, they have already tried all sorts of things. So they thought the person will not go to that primary care, no matter what you do. So until we address that, uh, where we can walk across the counter to buy some of the most potent medicines there is without prescription, then you can't, you, you, if like set up primary care centers in every village, every ward, people are not going to use it. And that's the pressure we are facing. So for us, we run a primary care clinic too, general practice clinic also. So we are catering for the whole spectrum, primary, secondary, and tertiary care. It's not supposed to be so. It's not supposed to be so. But until I think we address that part of where people, somebody, anybody, almost anybody in Nigeria, if you have a fever now, you, the, the first thing to go to across the the the, 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 the patent medicine store okay. and, and, and buy that. All right. Yeah. All right, we have to leave you here now. Professor Darlington Obaseki, the Chief Medical Director, University of Benin Teaching Hospital, reaching us from Benin. Thank you so much for your time and insight into all of this. We look forward to greater days ahead for the medical profession in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.